Good evening, fancy meat computers. How is everybody today? I hope everybody's doing A-OK -okay on this, your Wednesday evening. Numbers. Testing, 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 testing. I got my STM to go blink, blink. Test is good. Very good. Congratulations. <clears throat> I opened my box upside down and almost dropped my board. Getting your deposit back fail. Eh. I shoveled for the first time in my life on Monday, lol. Apartment building life. I was shoveling for four hours on Monday. Four, four and a half hours, something like that. After about the second hour, you kind of lose track of time. Still not as bad as they got in Welland. Um, yeah, so class was canceled on Monday. Uh, so if you thought that uh, class was going to happen, it didn't. You'll notice that uh, in the announcements feed, I even specified Monday was a snow day. I don't know why a physical a uh, a physical um, snowblower. What? Oh, you know that thing where you like read a a word and then you say it. Yeah. Signs to buy a snowblower. Yes. Well, you know, it's money. Um, just get a flamethrower. That is the correct solution. That's the engineering solution. Built a snowman right before this lecture. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Um, well, I, you see, I was pretty sure that we wouldn't need salt because, like, I'd looked at the, I'd looked at the, uh, the weather forecast, and it was calling for rain on Wednesday. So I was like, well, if it's going to be warm enough to rain by Wednesday, then probably I don't have to put any salt down because in two days, all of anything that's still stuck to the ground is going to be melted anyway, which turned out to be true. So. Yeah. Oh, for the flamethrower, right, yeah. Well, we could just use, like, we just put salt in the flame. Right? It'll turn it a different color, too. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, yeah? I take it other places are getting much colder weather than Hamilton is right now? I'm also down the mountain, so that helps a lot. But it got up to, like, 7 degrees above Celsius today. But, uh... But yeah. In Niagara Falls, once the snow was shoveled from the driveways, the piles were over six feet tall. Impressive. So, if you um, if you uh, if you have a pile of snow six feet tall, can you get to like the roof of your house from that from that pile of snow? That's the real question. Can you use like a window on a second story of your house as a door? Otherwise, not real snow. I'm kidding. Any snow is real snow, but I don't really consider it to be a good dump unless it's at least up to my knees. But anyway, um, <laughs> the answer is yes. Yes, you can. And it's amazing and horrible at the same time. So, <clears throat> I just wanted to give you a quick note 
about the lab kits. Um, how many people have got their lab kits so far, by the way? I'm going to do a poll. Got your lab kit yet, punk? Perhaps people will be offended by my calling them punk. The real question is the pile of snow really six feet or is it five foot eleven? Hmm. My gosh. Yeah. Apparently there's this, like, town in, like, the north of Russia in Siberia where, like, like, I forget what it's called, but they have some pretty extreme snow events. So, getting your lab kit. Just a couple of notes. All right. First of all, you will not be allowed to participate in lab activities until you've completed the lab safety kit quiz. That's not about lab kit kits, but it's still correct. You have to finish the lab safety quiz to be permitted to work in the lab. That's why we do it. It's like a WMIS training thing. It's actually a, like a, a, you know, hard requirement, shall we say. Uh, fortunately, it's pretty easy if you were paying attention. And second, if you missed your lab section this week, or you know you will go you're going to have to miss it, you can either pick up your lab kit next week, or you can pick it up during one of the other scheduled lab sections. Also, you can pick up uh, your lab kit during a different scheduled lab section next week. So basically drop by any lab session and you'll be able to pick up your lab kit if you weren't able to get it during your own. Ta-da. Had to dig out the recycling bins. They were completely buried in snow. Oof. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah. Um, good. About two-thirds of you have your lab kits, so that's good. Lab safety quiz seemed to have an error question asking where to find it. first aid kits. Oh. Huh. Interesting. Well, um, for those of you who... Uh, am I lagging? Hello? 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 Maybe I'm just not moving. The lab safety quiz is on Avenue, yes. Uh, and um, the correct answer is 211. I think there is also one in 211, but it might not be. Uh... At any rate. <clears throat> so, we should stop dilly-dallying. Yeah. And uh, we should we should get on with it. Hey? So, when last we were speaking, uh, we were talking about, we were just getting into topic one, which is roughly speaking about computer architecture. Uh, that is to say, architecture of microcontrollers specifically. Uh, we went through a bunch of examples of microcontrollers in use in sort of the modern era and modern devices. Although, I'm sure that a few of these are not exactly new at the point of publication of this. Like, I'm sure this, this is one of the old Fitbits, for example. Um, if I know I'm going to miss it because one of my roommates tested positive, when should I get it and should I email anybody? No, you can just come to, like, whatever section, whatever lab section is next after you're able to come back again. Hope Like, the self-isolation period is five days now, right? So you should be fine by next week, correct? watching this video on my phone. Ugh. Uh, my, my, my sympathies. So, um, so we had talked a little bit about the difference between von Neumann and Harvard architectures. Um, essentially, the difference is with von Neumann, you have the instruction and data memory stored in the same location, whereas with Harvard architecture, your memory, uh, your data memory and your instruction memory is accessed by different buses. So that can speed things up. Um, yeah. So, a more detailed view. We The control unit requires instructions and data, right? Uh, so does, and the, uh, the arithmetic logic unit is primarily um, grabbing, like, the arithmetic logic unit is 
um, finding the addresses, right? Because you need an address to get at the memory, right? Uh, under von Neumann. Whereas in Harvard architecture, the instruction and the data buses are separated. Um, so you can have parallel communication going on over those two. So, so it turns out not all ARM architectures are Harvard architecture. Um, basically, the higher numbered cores are. The lower ones are still von Neumann. And, you know, it makes sense because the, uh, the lower numbers, like the M0 and the M1, these are made to be extremely lightweight. Um, you know, they're made for lightweight applications. So you don't necessarily need the improvements that are derived from the Harvard architecture because the, um, you know, it's more space on the chip to do that. It's also more electricity that it requires to do that. So while it does speed things up, it's, you know, if you're going for like low power consumption with very little actual, you know, um, speed requirement, then, you know, von Neumann does just fine. And you can use a lower, um, a lower architecture. So, good. So let's talk about code then. Let's sort of switch gears a little bit. So this is not going to come as a huge, th this shouldn't come as a huge shock to you guys because you guys took two MP3. Um, but this is generally speaking how a program gets compiled and executed. The C program, generally speaking, is what you would be writing, right? Um, in this particular example, this is just very, very simple example of summing um, the numbers between one and or yeah, one and ten. The um, the high level language, of course, is better for productivity and portability. We compile that down to the assembly level, the assembly level program, which has. Like, each one of the lines in an assembly program is a CPU instruction, right? So move S is an instruction, add S is an instruction, BLT is not a sandwich. Um, it is an instruction. Branch less than. So the C compiler compiles down to the level of individual CPU instructions. Um, these are still human readable, though. Um, very often when you invoke a compiler like GCC, it'll skip, like it won't necessarily generate textual assembly language. It'll jump right over this intermediate step right to the assembled machine program. So the machine program, um, the machine program is the ones and zeros that are represented by um, y these commands, right? It's like when you when you like send this assembly program to the CPU, it isn't decoding characters, it isn't parsing strings, it is operating on ones and zeros because that's what it does. So like each one of these instruction codes will map to a particular arrangement of ones and zeros that designate an instruction. Each one of the registers will do likewise. So, you know, and that's that's essentially, you know, each one of these instructions maps to at least one of these 16-bit? Uh, uh, yeah, I think 16-bit numbers. So, question. Why is there a dead loop? Very good question. While one. So... This is fairly common in embedded systems, actually. Um, rather than have your uh, program terminate and have control return to the operating system which invokes the program, which is the environment that you guys will be used to so far, in this case, like you have to kind of think of these C programs as existing in the absence of an operating system per se. right? So 
um, for a especially the more lightweight embedded systems, you have to think about like there's no operating system to return control to. There's no return statement, right? So what while one does, you know, the quote unquote dead loop, is it just traps execution in an infinite loop until um, you know until the program terminate or until the device is reset um, or something like that. Basically, once it's finished, it just I it just idles, right? And this is actually not necessarily a bad like this isn't what you wouldn't like like you want this um, a lot of the time. Um, a lot of the time, an embedded system from a sort of programming design standpoint will rely on what are called interrupts. And we're going to be discussing interrupts at length later on in the course. But um, an interrupt is basically the same thing as a signal. You know, you may remember from 2MP3, we did a little bit on signal handling. Um, essentially, the program receives a, an interrupt and it, if it has defined a corresponding interrupt service routine, uh, which is a fancy way to, that's, that's a fancy term for a function that handles an interrupt, uh, just like signal handling function handles a signal, um, it'll break out of this infinite loop, go into the uh, interrupt service routine, service that routine, and then jump back into the infinite loop. So like an infinite loop is not necessarily like, it's not the dead end that it is in programming on a computer, right? Um, so, embedded systems are almost always running. You're, you code the rest in interrupt functions. Yeah. Very succinctly put. Thank you, Ariel. Um, is this used when you need to wait for the user to give it a command, press a button, etc.? Uh, yeah, so basically there are two approaches to it, right? And we're going to get into this. But there's, uh, there's polling and there's interrupts. Polling is easier to program. Basically, if you're polling, all you would do is you'd take this loop and you'd put like some code that's watching for uh, state changing, uh, states being changed on the uh, the GPIO pins, um, which is next. That's next lecture, uh, or you know, if we finish this one, GPIO, uh, general purpose input output pins. Um, so that's one way you can do it. You can just have the loop constantly checking, but a somewhat less um, resource intense way of going about that is to wire up these um, these pins to an interrupt, right? Force the pins to cause an interrupt state, then have that interrupt handled by an interrupt service routine. So it's essentially like push a button, call a function, right? Which is kind of cool. Whereas um, here, it's like the loop is waiting for the button to be pushed, and when it detects the button is pushed, it calls the function. But yeah, um, so yeah, that's so that's what the the purpose of the dead loop is. You'll see those more often than not when we do actual code, coding examples. So here's another example of a program. So this is a fairly simple one. We've got A, B, and C. C is just A plus B, and we just return zero. Um, this translates quite easily and directly into assembly code, which is why it's been written that way. Um, so we've got move S, R1, move S, R2, add S, R3, move S, R0. So you can see that uh, up to about... So it looks like the um, the the uh, the operation codes here are um, let's see R one hex zero. Well, we can probably assume that it's split down the middle. I was trying to figure out like how many bits it's giving to the to the actual instruction code, but like some number of bits in the front. That's the that's the instruction code. You can see like move s move s move s. Um, this sequence, this sequence, this sequence, um, you know, but it's it's like how many registers do you get, right? But uh, why is there an S on the end of move and add? Good question. 
Um, I'm guessing you would need a sleep function in the loop so it doesn't get very hot. Yeah, that would be, yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Um, like, if that's a concern, right? Um, the problem is that often in these types of situations, you also want a pretty quick reaction time. So if you have it sleep for a second, for one second, like it can actually miss a button press if the button press sort of follow falls between the time that, you know, if it's like, you know, it checks for sleep and then it checks again for sleep here. And then it's like, you know, you press the button and then you unpress the button and it's all contained within that those two discrete moments in time, uh, then the button press will go undetected, right? So, um, but yeah, sleep is kind of like, mm, yeah. Um, generally speaking, don't worry too much about the thing overheating. So, why is there an S on the, move, on the end of move and add? Well, move... Uh, so what S means is you also is also write the result of this to the status register. Um, so the status register is used to um, determine. Um, won't the compiler just send no op instruction so it doesn't get too hot? Uh, possibly. To be honest with you, Ariel, that's kind of like that's deeper than I've gotten so far. But yeah. Um, So, uh, by setting the status register, that allows the branch condition, like, the branch condition uses the status register to determine whether or not to branch, like, branch less than, branch greater than, They're, these are all using different combinations of bits in the status register to determine whether or not to actually branch the program, or to jump to another point in the program. So. What add s and move s do is they allow you to um, they they allow you to set the status register and perform an operation in one command, which is pretty efficient. There is a command which just sets the status register. It's called com uh, cmp or compare, uh, but this is like slightly more efficient. Um, the other reason is uh, certain assembly code uh, like codes like certain of these machine codes, um, actually, uh, they actually take up less space. So I believe I remember reading in the, in the textbook that move s and add s um, are like shorter commands. Like they take, they have less, fewer bits allocated to them than, um, than the, uh, the others. So that might be why they're being used in this case. But there you go. So, Process registers. Um, so again, sort of getting into the assembly end of things. Um, how about a question? Let me ask a question here. How many of you remember using BizUL to do assembly programming into MP3? So, <clears throat> um, so, assemb so assembly op, like the, the machine code instructions operate directly on the registers of, like, um, of the processor, right? So in ARM architectures in general, um, you've got uh, general purpose registers R0 through R12, which are just available for you to use. There's no restriction on your use of them. Um, you know, when we, when we, you know, use registers to represent variables, that's, you know, this is where it's going, is into the general purpose registers. Aside from that, you've got a number of other registers which are um, used for various purposes. So R13 is the stack pointer, right? 
Um, so you need to know what stack frame you're in. So the stack pointer shows you what stack frame you're in. The link register, uh, I'm not sure what that does to be honest, but 15 is the program pointer, uh, program counter, which is like of paramount importance. So branch statements allow you to jump to other tags in the code, right? So for example, branch less than loop, if the condition comes out true, you jump to the loop label, right? That is correctly thought of as an operation on register 15, the program counter. Um, so that's, uh, you know, so as, as you go through the program, the program counter uh, keeps track of what the next instruction is. And whenever you execute an instruction, the program counter is incremented so that it's then pointing to the next instruction. Uh, unless it's a branch statement, in which case you move the program pointer to some other point in the program. But, uh, good. So, hopefully you guys, like, this This is fairly uh, similar to um, the visual ARM, uh, ARM assembly emulator. So, you know, there you go. close. There we go. What? Yes, I want. I confirm exiting. Thank you. Jeez. So, <clears throat> the program counter is a register that holds the memory address of the next instruction to be fetched from the memory. So, um, if we have these instructions, right, which... Um, They look like they're the these guys, but in reverse order, actually, which is interesting. Um, oh yeah, yeah, because you'd be going up to higher addresses. These are these are in order of address. So the bottom is the beginning of the program, and the top is the end of the program, relative to this guy, right? Where here, this is the top of the program. Um, when you're actually viewing the memory, the top of the program is at a lower address. So in these types of representations, it ends up, like, bass backwards. Um, so does the program counter start at 0 and go 1, 2, 3? That's an excellent question that's actually answered on this particular slide. Um, so no, um, it starts at the first memory address of the, uh, the program in the instruction memory. So in this particular case, if this is a complete view of our instruction memory, the first, uh, the first value that the program pointer or the program counter will have is hexadecimal 080001ac, this guy right here. And you can see that it's being added, like you add two each time. So it's actually counting up by twos. The link register holds memory the memory address of the next instruction that should be called after a subroutine is called. It also holds the value that tells you if you are in MSP or PSP. Right. So. Mm-hmm. So, when you enter a subroutine, it is necessary to know how to get back out of that subroutine. So... If my understanding of the link register is correct, the link register tells you where you re-enter a program from the subroutine that you're currently in. It only holds the MSP or PSP if you are in an interrupt. There you go. Thank you, Ariel. Um, hey, Ariel, do you want to do you want to TA this class at the same time as taking it? I've actually seen that happen once or twice in grad school. Somebody TAing a class as they were taking it. They don't mark their own work, though. That would obviously be a conflict of interest. So. <clears throat> so now I'd like to introduce a very, very, very important and fundamental concept uh, when it comes to digital electronics, which you probably haven't, like, encountered 
I'm not sure they would, uh, well, it's straight out of the textbook. Yeah, I know, but you actually read the textbook, so. Um. Yeah. Oh, you've got a digital version and you're looking stuff up. Ah, so it's not all in your brain. Ha! That's okay. Um, being able to look it up quickly is effectively the same as knowing it, right? Anyway. <laughs> so, there are two things to understand about how an instruction is actually executed. It's a three-step process, right? Um, first, the instruction that you're about to execute must be fetched from instruction memory. So, here. So step one is the instruction has to be fetched from instruction memory into the control unit. Then it must be decoded, right? So you decode it to find out which particular operation inside the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, is actually needing to be a, needing to be performed. And then step three, you actually execute it and it gets sent back. Um, oh, well, being able to look it up in a, a physical textbook is even even more impressive. So, um, so it's fetch, decode, execute. Right, and that takes three clock cycles. Um, I know you guys probably, you probably aren't like used to thinking in clock cycles yet. But um, so here's a very like, very quick um, Coles notes version of how a computer works. Um, so inside of a computer, you have a, a signal called a clock signal. It's not. This isn't a register inside the CPU. This is an electronic signal that is run to many, 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 many of the chips uh, and various uh, components inside of the CP inside of the the, the processor. Um, so the clock cycle, like generally speaking, things are performed on a rising clock edge. Sometimes falling, but most of the time it's a rising clock edge. So when this guy flips from a zero state to a one state, it's like, okay, everybody, execute instruction. Like, do a thing. Um, so basically, all of the circuits have until the next clock cycle to get into a steady state, you know, if... Uh, so that for the next clock cycle, everything is in its proper state for the next clock cycle, and you don't have intermediate, um, you know, signal propagation delays, which are interfering with the calculation of things. So you can kind of think of it like thing, things are done on rising clock edges. Um, is This is kind of like the clock signals we used for finite state machines in 2E04, right? Uh, I probably... Probably. I don't, like, I. it's been a while, and I, I don't know 2E04, but yeah. Ariel has confirmed, so that you can take that to the bank. So, <clears throat> so essentially, uh, executing an instruction is a three-clock cycle operation, right? So fetching, decoding, and executing each takes one clock cycle. Which part of the computer provides the clock signal? Normally, there's an oscillator chip, or um, not chip. Normally, no, ugh, pardon me. Normally, there's an oscillator. Um, it's like it, it's a particular piece. It's like an electronic piece, kind of similar to uh, a capacitor or a resistor. Like it's in that category of thing. It's um, the oscillator contains a small crystal, which. Um, will oscillate at a certain frequency when applied. you apply electric voltage to it. Um, and um, you, um, like that, that generates the, that generates the, um, the clock signal with very, very exact precision. It's like, you know how they say, you know, this is a quartz watch, or at least they used to. Um, uh, quartz crystals are known for having very, very stable oscillation patterns, so they're often used. Um, 
for this type of thing. But anyway, so the clock signal is generated by a crystal that is embedded somewhere inside of the electronics of the of the system. But so so essentially the problem that we have here, right? Um Ariel, if I teach the course again, um, yeah, come talk to me. Um, so the problem is, if it takes three clock cycles to fetch, decode, and execute an instruction, um, that's a long time, right? If we could speed it up so that we could, you know... If we could, like, if we could speed it up and, you know, this is showing you how it's sped up, if we pipeline these, we can execute one of these operations, um, essentially per clock cycle, which allows you to speed up the whole thing by a factor of three. Um, so the reason pipelining works is that the actual physical circuitry used to fetch decode and execute the instructions are physically distinct and separate right so the instruction the instruction fetching circuit can execute something at the same time that the the decode circuit is decoding something else at the same time that the execution circuit can execute something else so by so because they don't all have to be operating on the same thing at the, because they can all be operating on different things at the same time you can set up what's called a pipeline so you're feeding in one instruction per clock cycle but yeah so via what means does the crystal generate the clock cycle atom vibrations or something uh, yeah something like that like um might be like a piezoelectric effect. I'm not sure. In our STM32, the, quart the quartz oscillator is the two oval-looking components that are on the same side of as the screen. They have metal shell. Yeah, actually, I have a picture of the STM board here. We probably... Um... So, normally, these guys, yeah, the TC, uh, t the TXC... Is that is that the one you're talking about? I th I'm pretty sure that's what an oscillator looks like. The TXCs, yeah, yeah, cool. So, um, for the physics of how oscillators work, I would recommend uh, attending a physics class. <laughs> for me, it's enough that they work. <laughs> but yeah, so, um. Yeah, that's all materials engineering stuff, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's interesting, but it's just not my area. So, one of the interesting things about the instructions that you have, um, not all of the instructions are, like, so, the registers hold 32 bits, but not we don't need, you know, 2 to the power of 32 instructions. 16-bit uh, will do, right? So you can actually fit two 16-bit two instructions inside of one 32-bit instruction. Because the instruction memory is continuous, you can load multiple instructions at once by accessing 32 bits all at once, right? So... Um, so, like, you can load two of these guys at once, basically. And pipelining that looks like this, right? Um, so the question is, like, is this useful? Because you're eventually going to, like, back... Like, these guys are going to back up sufficiently that it's going to get far enough away from these guys, you know. Uh, but, you know, you can actually save um, memory by uh, using 16-bit and instructions to, instead of 32-bit instructions. <clears throat> so, um, we have an example in the next few slides that we're going to go through. This is our, These are our instructions of our small program that we've been doing so far, right? 
So our program counter starts off with the address 08001AC. Um, yeah. Um, so quartz gives electricity when hit, when quartz, when hit, uh, quartz gives electricity when hit, when quartz gets electricity, it moves, putting it into a very specific thing will make it move and then power and move and power. So it vibrates at a specific rate. Um, all you need to know about uh, that, all you need to know about that for this course is that oscillators will provide a predictable clock signal that's used by the hardware. Very good. Thank you, Avery. Um, and thank you, Ariel. Sonia. Sorry, I'm not too sure what the pipelining term is referring to in the fetch decode execution part. Right, so I'll tell you why it's called pipelining then. So, the idea is the same as an assembly line, right? It's like, you know, you have a part, it comes down, one robot does something to it, it travels further, a different robot does something to it, it travels further, a different robot does something to it. It's like a pipe, right? The data is being piped through the operations, right? So that's where the idea of pipelining comes from. So, so our first instruction is to move the value 0, 0 into R1. So we do that. Bing, bang, boom. Next, PC is equal to PC plus 2. So the, P the program counter is incremented by 2 bytes to the next value. Um, thumb 2 consists of a mix of 16 and 32-bit instructions. In reality, we always fight we always fetch four bytes from instruction memory, either one 32-bit instruction or two 16-bit instructions. To simplify the demo, we will assume we only fetch two bytes from the instruction memory. So we're going to assume we're just fetching 16-bit instructions. How come the instructions can be stacked like that? So this is a view of the memory, right? So you should think of this as being like a RAM chip, right? Or a you know, this is memory. So at this memory address, we have this value. At this memory address, we have this value. This is all in hexadecimal, by the way. At this memory address, we have this value. At the right? So this is located somewhere between the lowest memory and the highest memory address. Um... I meant on the pipeline side. Oh, um, again, that's kind of like the crux of the idea of pipelining, right? So the idea is the circuit that fetches, decodes, and executes are separate and distinct circuits, so they can be operating on different things at the same time. So instruction one can be fetched, then you fetch instruction two, then you fetch instruction three on like consecutive clock cycles because the fetch circuit once once you fetch instruction i you're done right with that part of the circuit you can pass that to the decode um, which means that on the next cycle you can load up the next instruction and then pass that on to decode on cycle three while you're fetching the next instruction that's the idea of pipelining so so anyway so we increment the program counter. We then move one into R2. Bing, bang, boom. Increment the program counter. The next operation is add S. So add S, we store in R3 the result of adding R1 and R2. So from the registers, we pipe R1 and R2 into the arithmetic logic unit and then pipe that back out into R3. So the interconnections here, right, what the what the uh, instructions are actually doing is like do you guys know what a multiplexer is do you guys know what a uh well you should multiplexers are required knowledge i think at this point um so essentially you can think of like um you can think of like a block 
like a, a, a piece of, of hardware that adds, right? And you can think of multiplexers, two multiplexers, one for each operand. Each of the registers feeds into, uh, like all of the registers feed into these two operands, right? And the, um, the instruction code selects the register by controlling which of the inputs to the multiplexer gets uh, allowed through to the arithmetic logic unit. Um, oh, you guys don't know what a multiplexer is. Ah, okay. Uh, okay, so um, let me let me just. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a fancy type of lookup. To, uh, just give me a second. Multiplexer. Let's see. Right. So. Right, this is a good one. So, essentially, with a multiplexer, you have multiple input leads, one output lead, and a a, a um another lead a, another wire that provides a signal switching between the inputs. Right. So, if you know, in this very simple example, if the uh, if SEL uh, select, I guess it's if se the selection signal is zero, then zero is routed to the output. Otherwise, um, one, right? Now, if you take this and you expand it to like 16 inputs and you need four bits to select between them, that's what the register is doing. It's multiplexing the signal into the arithmetic logic unit inputs. All right. We're going to take it in embedded systems too. Oh, okay. Well, at any rate, it's it's not a difficult concept. Actually, I I rather like multiplexers. So, um, so the add operation dumps it into R three. We then move. Um, move uh zero back into R zero, and um and R3 disappeared for some reason. But um, but yeah, and then we just loop forever. So. Uh, like the decoder chip we used in 2E04 to convert a binary number to a decimal. Would that be a multiplexer? Um, no. No. Um, so, okay. I, it's just a type of switch. It's really just a type of switch. Um, if I had a chalkboard, I would be doing on a chalkboard right now. Oh, well, it might have a multiplexer in it, but... It took input and made one output. Yeah. Well, normally when you talk about multiplexer, you're talking about something like at the individual sort of bit level. Um, like I don't, I don't think it's useful to confuse um, multiplexing with uh, digital to analog conversion, which is or like, like how is the digital signal being encoded right or like not digital like how is the decimal number being encoded is it being encoded in binary code or are you talking about an analog signal right so multiplexer uh, pen yeah okay Need more pixels. Yeah. Yeah, so, like, it's, yeah. Uh, the, the point with a multiplexer, and, like, multiplexers are a very specific thing, right? Um, a multiplexer, right, 
we'll take, you know, let's say, you know, uh, where's my pointer? Ugh, there we go. It'll take, you know, say four lines for now, right? And two selector li lines, right? And it has only one output. So you can kind of think internally that um, in the case where, like, this is zero, zero, like, when this is zero and this is zero, you connect up this one, right? When it's zero, one, you connect up this one. When it's one, zero, you connect up this one. When it's one, one, you connect up this one. The ver like, the important thing about a multiplexer is that there is a one output, right? Unless you want to, like, 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 you can imagine, like, you know, all of the 16 or 32 bits of a register being passed into these, right? Like, obviously you would need one of these for each bit, right? Or you'd need a fancy type of multiplexer that multiplexes over all, um, you know, all 32 of them. But, uh, yeah. Um, Ariel, you can't, uh, send me, uh, you can't send links. Um, but yeah, anyway. Well, that, that's class, actually. So, I guess, let me just take a look, see if we, yeah, we finished that. So, there we go. Uh, one last point. The program counter is, uh, incremented by four because you're loading, you're always loading 32 bits from instruction memory even if it's two 16-bit instructions. So there you go. Good. Any questions? Basically, you can multiplex. Like, every time, every lead that you... Or, every lead. Every, uh, e every input line that you add here... Um, multiplies the number of inputs to the multiplexer that you can manage by two. If you want to get right down technical, um, yeah, um, it was just a decoder. A multiplexer would take a binary decoder's output as well as connecting to that to a switch so that it just outputs one. Yeah, yep. Oh, where could we read more about this in the textbook? About multiplexers? Uh, I don't know if multiplexers are in the textbook. It's not really, like, maybe it is. Let me take a look. Nope. Multiplexers aren't in the textbook. You'll have to, uh, you'll have to look it up in a, uh, something more about digital, digital electronics. But, uh, this is actually a very useful way to think about, for example, um, memory access, right? So if you imagine, like, if this is your memory, like your program memory, right, with all kinds of registers all over here, right? I don't know if this is exactly how it's done, but, or not registers, memory cells, but this is a, like, this is a good way of thinking about it. If you have, like, one gigantic multiplexer that's feeding from each of these individual memory cells and you have like you know however many digits uh, there are uh, however many binary digits there are in the memory address as the number of selection lines then this is how memory is read to produce one single value which it can then be you know put into the ALU or whatever Oh, just general memory stuff? No, this is, um, this is still in, uh, chapter one. We're talking about, um, section, 
um, 1.4, roughly speaking. Yep, 1.4. Good. Um, any other questions? Took three binary, three bit binary input, and then gave us one of eight outputs. Okay, well, uh, I think that's everything for today. Can't believe you guys don't know what a multiplexer is. Um, what are they even teaching you? What are they even teaching you in uh, 2E04? Like, multiplexers are pretty important. Like, it's a really important concept. <clears throat> um, yeah, take her easy, folks. And uh, see you tomorrow. Okay, Grish asked me a question. Why did I change my iconic background? It's because I got, uh, like, um, Mint. I got a new version of Mint, and it had a bunch of new backgrounds, and I wanted to try them. I didn't realize that, like, my background had become iconic. But, yeah, there are lots of cool ones. That, ooh, I kind of like that one, too. It's like, this, it's like the other one, but more sinister. I'll keep that. Dark theme, am I right? Hmm. <laughs>